Welcome back to the Mac Tech Tech. Today we have another custom commander build featuring Cleopatra Exiled Pharaoh. This episode is dedicated to Cute Apot's Art. Over on Instagram, they are a friend of the channel and asked us if we would build this deck for them. Well, the caveat for this deck, unlike most of our builds, is that no individual card could be over $100, so we're less focused on being super budget and more focused on kind of being high power without being full-blown CEDH. Let's get started. So Cleopatra, Exiled Pharaoh. A 2-4 for 4 mana. At the beginning of your end step, you're going to pass out some plus 1 plus 1 counters to some other legendary creatures. And whatever a legendary creature you control with counters on it dies, you're going to draw a card for each counter on them and lose 2 life. Not a big deal. So, what are we doing? What's our game plan here? Well, the game plan is to fill our board with a bunch of legendary creatures that either naturally gain counters on their own or pass out counters to other creatures, uh, have ways of sacrificing those creatures, and then ideally returning those creatures that we sacrificed. What is dead may never die. Let's get started with those creatures that are generating some plus one plus one counters either for themselves or for others. At the top of this list we have Arwen Weaver of Hope. So a 2-1 for 3 mana that each other creature we control is going to enter the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on them equal to their toughness. So naturally 1, but if we play them on turn 3, get our commander out on turn 4, we're already going to start passing out some counters to them because they are a legendary creature and they're going to pass out extra plus one plus one counters to all of our creatures. Eveline de Grand Pre. I'm probably mispronouncing that, my apologies, but they're a 3-3 three, three for 4 mana from the Assassin's Creed set. They have Death Touch. You could disguise them if you really wanted to. Not really my bag, but like, it's an option. Whenever a creature you control with Death Touch deals combat damage to a player, they get that many plus one plus one counters. So they're actually fairly budget. They're like a 30, 40 cent card. Um, but they're gonna go ahead and suit themselves up. And once they're large enough, we can sack them. You know, we'll get a bunch of value there. They, they're great on attack. They're great in defense. They're great all around. Of course, a legendary creature that needs no introduction in the plus one plus one counter sort of synergy is Bristly Bill Spine Sower. Two mana, two two, landfall, pass out a counter. And for five mana, just go ahead and double all the plus one plus one counters on your creatures. This is big value for this stack. Going a bit more budget again, we have Drawna Liberator of Malakir. So a two three for three, not bad, flying first strike. Pretty good. When they deal combat damage to a player, they pass out a plus one plus one counter to all of our attacking creatures, including themselves. Obviously, they've already dealt their damage, so they're not going to get that little bonus. But all of our other creatures are going to get a little stronger. Grekma, Skyclave, Ravenger. So a 0 0 for 3, but really, they're at least a 3 3 for 3, because they enter with 3 plus one plus one counters. When another creature we control dies, if it had a plus one plus one counter on it, they pretty much all should. They're going to go ahead and get another plus one plus one counter. And when they die, they're going to replace themselves with a XX token creature uh, equal to their power. So they're getting bigger as we sack our creatures. Once they eventually get sacked themselves, they're going to give us a big creature on top of all that card draw from our, you know, our commander. And when we bring them back, we're just going to be able to rinse and repeat. It's a good time. When the Eyes of Gaia is going to follow that up, they are a 2-3 three for 3, and they tap for 2 mana in any combination of colors. This mana can only be spent to cast creature spells or activate creature abilities. Should the creature in question be at least a 5 cost or greater, we're going to get a counter on Gwenna and untap them, allowing us to reuse them throughout the turn. Following up Gwenna, we have Legolas Greenleaf. A 2-2 two, two for 3 mana. They are a Reaching Elf Archer. Uh, they can't be blocked by little weenies, so anything with 2 power or less, we're just sneaking on by. And whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under our control, we get to put a plus 1, plus 1 counter onto Legolas Greenleaf. 
And whenever they deal combat theme is show a player, we do get to draw a card. Little icing on that cake. Lily Bowen Raging Grandma. A 0 0 for 4 mana, but it's actually a 2 2. But at your upkeep, we're going to start doubling up those counters. Up until the point where it exceeds 16. Once it's over 16, the next time we would normally double it, we basically take all of them off except for one and we gain that much life, which is going to help us offset the fact that we're losing life every time we sack a creature with our commander in play. Mazurk Crawl Death Priest. So Mazurk Crawl is a 2-2 two, two for 5, kind of bad value. They do fly, which is nice, and whenever another player sacrifices a permanent, we get to put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each of our creatures. And that's really where their value lies. We're sacking things left and right in this deck, and if any of our opponents are playing with treasures, food, clues, blood tokens maybe? You name it though. Like, sacrificing is happening in these games, and we're going to gain a lot of power from it. Up next is Rayhan, last of the Abzan. A 0-0 zero, zero for 3, but again, they're actually a 3-3 three, three for 3. Whenever a creature we control dies or is put into the command zone, love that. If it had counters on it, we get to take all of those counters and put it onto another creature. Rishkar Pima Renegade. So Rishkar is out here being a 2-2 for 3. They do pass out two 1-1 one, one counters to up to two different creatures. And make it to all of our creatures that have counters on them. Now tap for green mana. Skullbriar the Walking Grave is up next. They are a 1-1 one, one hasty boy for 2 mana. Whenever they deal combat damage to a player, they get a counter on them, and those counters remain as they move between different zones. The last of our plus one plus one generating creatures is Yeheni Undying Partisan. So a three cost, two two with haste. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, they get a counter, and they're also a sack outlet for us, allowing us to sacrifice a creature to give them indestructible for the turn. Of course, the creatures aren't the only ways that we're generating these plus one plus one counters. Fangs of Colonia is a two cost sorcery that has us put a plus one plus one counter on a creature we control and then double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature that had a counter put on it this way. We can also overload it for six, letting our whole board get a little bigger and then double those counters. So, feels really strong here. Moving on down from those sorceries into the instance, we do have a revitalizing repast. So for a single mana, we're going to go ahead and put a plus one plus one counter onto a creature and make that creature indestructible for the turn. In a similar vein, in terms of being a kind of responsive thing, we do have Silk Guard. So Silk Guard is an X and a green pip for an instant where we put a plus one plus one counter on up to each of up to X target creatures. And then all of our modified creatures gain hexproof for the turn. Moving from those more spell slingy type of effects to our more repeatable ones, we have Ozolith the Shattered Spire. So, it's enhancing the plus one plus one counters we're already passing out by giving one extra each time. And for one to green, we could tap this down, pass out a counter. It's done at sorcery speed, but the fact that we're passing out extra counters and, you know, we're generating counters off of it makes it a pretty solid add to me. Of course, since we have a $100 budget per card, the Great Hinge is an easy add. Normally, 9 mana, but in this deck, basically just those two green pips, which it immediately replaces by being able to tap down for two green mana, also gaining us two life in the process. Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we get to put a plus one plus one counter onto that creature and draw a card. So, phenomenal. It's like a $50 to $60 card, though. Uh, but super solid. Moving down into the enchantment section, we have Court of Garenbrig. So, three mana, become the monarch. Already cool. Take the card draw. At our upkeep, we get to distribute two plus one plus one counters to up to two creatures. Uh, distributed between up to two creatures. So, it could be two on one, could be one on two. Either way, it's all good. Then, if we're the Monarch, we get to double the plus one plus one counters on each creature we control, making our creatures super big, super beefy, and allowing us to draw a ton of cards through Sacrifice. Of course, you know it, you love it, it's new, it's Innkeeper's Talent, 
wishing I had, like, pre-ordered a bunch of these when the set was being released, because they were down to, like, a dollar or two, and now they're back up to, like, 20 bucks. Um, but this is an enchantment class. At the beginning of combat, you're going to put a plus one, plus one counter onto a creature you control. Already pretty good. Level two gives all of your permanents with counters ward one, which is a nice sort of way of being like, hey, do you really want to pay those taxes to hit us? And the coup de gras, the reason why it's a $20 card. Uh, level three, right? If you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, you get twice as many instead. Uh, so super solid. With all those generators out of the way, let's see how we're enhancing them with things that don't naturally create the counters on their own, but if they see counters being made, give you a little bonus, a little treat. We're going to start off with the Corpse Jack Menace. Four, 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 four. If one or more would be put onto a creature you control, twice as many instead. We love it. Evolution Sage. Basically, landfall proliferate. All of our counters are going up. It's phenomenal. Kami of Whispered Hopes. This is a plus one situation instead of a doubling, but they also do tap down for mana equal to their power. So naturally they're tapping for one, but as we're passing out counters to them from other effects, they're going to tap for more and more mana. This isn't enhancing the amount of plus one plus one counters we're getting, but Kudum of the West Tree is going to give all of our modified creatures trample. And with basically all of our creatures being modified, it seems pretty solid. Up oh, here I in fact had missed one of the counter generators with Sorok and Goreclaw. Uh, they do also pass out Trampled all of our creatures, which is super solid, but they are a 6-5 for 6, and whenever another non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control, we get to put a plus one plus one counter onto it, and it gains Trample. Or not Trample, rather Haste until end of turn. Vorinclex Monstrous Raider. Another like $50 card, but they will double up the counters we're putting on all of our stuff, and also have the counters that our opponents are putting on their stuff. Inspiring Call is going to follow that up. So for three mana, we're going to draw a card for each of our creatures that have a plus one, plus one counter, and then they're all going to gain Indestructible. Right way of avoiding a board wipe. Which, honestly, depending on how big our board is with our commander on the field, could just result in us decking ourselves, and we definitely don't want to do that. Of course, any plus one, plus one counter support we have needs to also include the original, the OG, the Ozolith. So if any of our creatures would leave the field with counters on them, those counters are going to go onto the Ozolith. Beginning of combat, we get to move those counters around. With any of our counter doubling effects in play, it gets kind of crazy. Branching Evolution is kind of a similar vein. If one or more plus one plus one would be put onto any of our creatures, we get to put twice as many instead. Doubling Season, same thing. We're doubling up the amount of counters we're putting onto our stuff. Hard and Scales passes out just one, but for one green mana, still pretty good value. With all of those plus one, plus one counters and their synergies kind of out of the way, how are we getting rid of our creatures, right? We want them to die, but they're so big and beefy, we don't really want to rely on our opponents kind of like taking them out. So we have Braid's Arisen Nightmare. Three, three for three at our end step, we can sacrifice an artifact, creature, enchantment, or land, or a planeswalker even and force each opponent to do the same. For each one that doesn't, they're gonna lose two life and we're gonna draw a card. Disciple of Frailies. So this is a three, three for six, which already sounds expensive, I understand, but when they enter the battlefield, we do get to sacrifice another creature. We're then gonna gain life and draw cards equal to that creature's power. So, ton of value off this. If we're not in the mood for that, we can play them as a land, which we could shock in. So they're nice and versatile. I felt like they were a pretty safe add here. Curve Nod, Carnage, Dominus. Uh, so if a creature dying would trigger an ability, it's going to trigger twice. Not necessarily a sack outlet in of themselves, but they felt pretty solid. Fane the Broker. Uh, so I skipped over Fane earlier. They're actually kind of like a really good utility card in general for this deck. We can tap them down to sacrifice a creature to put two plus one plus one counters onto a creature. We can tap them down to remove a counter from any of our creatures and create a treasure token. We could also tap them down to sacrifice an artifact to create an inkling. Or we have the option of paying three and a black to untap Fane the Broker. All great effects, really here for that first one, uh, but I think that they all work pretty well here. Jared Golgari Lich Lord. 
Two, two for four, so kind of bad value, but they do get plus one, plus one for each creature in your graveyard. And for one and a Golgari, we get to sack a creature. Each opponent is going to lose life equal to the sacrifice creature's power. We could sacrifice a Swamp and Forest to return them to hand from grave. Probably not doing that, but it's an option. The Gitrog Ravenous Ride. 6-5 five for 5, so pretty decent. Trample Haste, we love it. Whenever they deal damage to a player, we may sacrifice a creature that saddled them. Their saddle cost is 1, so any creature basically we control could saddle them at any time. If we do, we're going to draw that many cards and then put that many lands uh, based on that creature's power onto the field. So, big ramp, big card draw, we're here for it. Of course, we need a Viscera Seer to sacrifice creatures at instant speed at no cost, being allowed to scry one each time we do. Last up, and this honestly could have been put into the plus one, plus one, you know, counters as well, but I, I feel like it fits a little better here, and that's Yigra, Eater of All. So a 6-6 six, six for five, Ward, Sacrifice of Food. Other creatures are food in addition to their other types, so they could be, you know, you could pay two and sack them. Pay two, tap and sack them, rather, to go ahead and gain three life. Whenever a food is put into the grave, they're going to get two counters. Uh, so just a really easy way of being like, hey, I'll pay two mana and tap down a creature to sack them. You know, let Yeager get a little bigger, do a bunch of card draw shenanigans. It's all good times. Back in budget territory with Rise of the Witch King. Four cost, sorcery. Each player is going to sacrifice a creature, but if we sacrifice a creature this way, we're going to be able to basically cheat a permanent back out onto the field. Flare of Malice. So we didn't play the other Flare, which is basically just a Cultivate. You definitely could have. I didn't feel like it was as strong as the Flare of Malice, uh, so that's why it's not here. But Flare of Malice, let's get back to it. You can sacrifice a non-token black creature rather than pay the spell's cost. That's great. We have a ton of creatures we can sack for this. Each opponent is also going to sacrifice a creature or planeswalker with the greatest mana value that they control. And, yeah, that's just good, right? You're likely getting rid of their big threat. You maybe sacrifice some, like, little dinky dude. You're getting value off that dinky dude anyways. It's all good. And it's a may, right? We don't have to sack. We can always pay the four. Let's go to Alter City. Using Altar of Dementia... Ashnod's Altar, and Phyrexian Altar. All these allow us to sacrifice creatures at instant speed and get various effects. So, Dementia is going to have us mill an opponent. Ashnod's Altar is just going to generate us two generic mana. And Phyrexian Altar is going to let us generate colored mana. Moving down into our enchantments, we have Greater Good. So, ton of card draw. We do have to discard three, but it's going to help us to feed into our reanimator strategy anyways. So, all good there. Speaking of reanimator strats, let's go over them. Starting off is the Evolution Witness. A 2-1 for three that could adapt two for two mana. Whenever one or more counters are put onto them, we're going to return a permanent from grave to hand. This is honestly great. You know, we have a couple different ways of passing out counters to any creature we really want. And this is going to let us basically sack creatures with Fane the Broker. That creature is going to be in the grave, part of the cost. He's going to put some counters on the Evolution Witness. We're going to take that creature back to hand, have the ability to recast them. And obviously those creatures that we're sacking should already have counters on them to feed our commander, to feed any other effects we want. They're all great. Marin of Clan Neltoth follows that up. There are three four for four mana. Whenever a creature we control dies, we're going to get an experience counter. At our end step, we get to choose a creature in our grave. If that creature's mana value is less than or equal to the experience counters we have, we're going to cheat them back onto the field. Otherwise, they're going to get cheated back into our hand, allowing us to recast them. Both modes are great, uh, but I'm really here for the fact that you know, with like a one-cost creature, right? Fane the Broker sacks them, passes out some counters. Marin's like, cool, have an experience counter. End of turn, that one-cost creature comes back. Of course, we're running Shieldred, the Whispering One. 
Uh, there's no other there, just Shieldred whispering one. But a 6-6 six, six for 7 has Swamp Walk. Let's us cheat a creature back at upkeep, forces our opponents to sack creatures. We love it. It wouldn't be a reanimator strategy without, well, reanimate. Uh, we are going to lose life based on the creature's mana value, but that's fine. Life's a resource, spend it. Victimize. So, this could have gone into the sacrifice outlet situation as well. It, it, it kind of fits both. But for three mana, we're going to choose two creatures in our graves to cheat back at the cost of sacrificing one creature. Feign death. So, again, kind of fits into multiple strats, right? We're getting a plus one, plus one counter on the creature, and we're reanimating it. So, when the creature dies, it actually gets returned to the battlefield tapped with a plus one, plus one counter. For one black pip, that's great. That's good value for us. In a similar, slightly more versatile spot, we have Malakir of Rebirth, by which I mean Malakir Rebirth. I just keep adding in extra words. They're not there. What am I doing? Not knowing how to read. Uh, but for a single black pip, we get to choose a creature, lose two life. Uh, when it dies, we basically get to return it to the battlefield tapped. No counter, but still good reanimation. Animate Dead is going to follow that up. Uh, so we're going to take a creature from our grave, put it directly into play with a minus one, minus zero counter. And should Animate Dead leave the field, we also do lose the creature. Uh, but still feels like pretty solid reanimation tech for us. But guys, that is the deck. I, you know, have it named at what cost. Uh, you know, what did you think of it? Are there other decks that you'd like to see kind of custom built? Were there cards that I didn't include in here that, like, are under 100 bucks that make sense? You know, uh, things of that nature. But hey, I'm Mechanized Minion, a.k.a. The Energy King. If you enjoyed the video, felt like you got some value, a little entertainment, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, do all the algorithm things for me. And until next time, good luck with your builds.